Okay, for this next example uh, for the forecast instrument, uh, we're going to set up an observation uh, in GRISM mode for forecast. Uh, and the science case here that we're going to uh, address is a low, resol low resolution GRISM spectroscopy um, to measure the overall mid infrared SED uh, of an object uh, and to also measure the solid state bands. So, for example, this would be like silicates, silicate absorption or emission. PH as ICES, etc. I think these are the kinds of emission and absorption features that don't require a terribly high resolution. So remember that the GRISM mode in forecast uh, has typical R values of you know 100 to 200, uh, so it's very low, very low resolution uh, spectroscopy. But you get a very large uh, spectral range, uh, so it's good for uh, you know covering large uh, large swaths of the mid infrared. Um, for your particular object of interest. For this observation, uh, the target is AB Arage. Uh, it's a very bright target. Um, and so uh, let's get on here. So the first thing we do, of course, is evaluate the, the feasibility. Uh, number one question is whether or not the target's been observed before. And so here again, you would uh, look at the DZS archive, uh, do a search on AB Arage. Uh, you can resolve uh, the target, you resolve the coordinates using Sinbad. Um, and then just search on the forecast GRISM mode only, and if uh, and if results come up, uh, make sure that uh, that you're proposing for either a much longer exposure time or perhaps different GRISMs. Okay, so uh, so we'll assume that uh, the target has not been observed before in uh, forecast GRISM mode. Uh, you would also check the reserved objects catalog uh, in the call for proposals. Uh, I already showed that to you uh, in the last example, the forecast imaging example. So go back and take a look at that if you want to see how the uh, uh, what the ROC looks like and the call for proposals. Uh, there is no reserved objects catalog for forecast for uh, observing cycle eight, so we have no no concerns for that either. Okay, so next um, we want to uh, establish our wavelength coverage and select our GRISM. And the way to get started on that is to take a Take a look at the observer's handbook. So here we can take a look. We can scroll down to performance uh, and grisms. So there are uh, six grisms available, but only four are being offered for uh, OC8. Um, and so you can see the uh, the wavelength coverage for each of the uh, excuse me, there's five, five GRISMs, but only four are available. Uh, so coverage goes from 4.9 to 8 microns, uh, 8.4 to 13.7, 17 to 27, and 28 to 37. Uh, you can get a better feel for that by looking at the, um, by the GRISM sensitivity chart down here. This is a nice chart to look at because it shows you not only the coverage uh, for each of the uh, low resolution grisms, um, but also uh, the uh, atmospheric transition uh, transmission across those bands. So you can tell like which parts of the uh, spectrum are going to be um, relatively clean uh, of atmospheric features and which parts are going to be um, less clean. So for example, uh, the G111 uh, grism uh, has a very nice window here. Uh, very clean atmospheric transmission, uh, whereas the G329 is riddled with uh, atmospheric lines, which all uh, take a toll on the sensitivity uh, as a function of wavelength across the GRISM range. Okay, so uh, in this case, it, since we're trying to uh, get a mid infrared uh, spectral energy distribution, and because there are, um, you know, the, the silicate features and PAH features and ices are sort of sprinkled throughout the mid infrared. Uh, we're just going to propose for all four GRISMs, the G63, 111, 227, and 329. And that should give us very nice um, low resolution coverage all the way from 5 microns out to about 35 to 37 microns. Okay. So you don't need to worry too much um, about the uh, sensitivities. Uh, here, uh, this gives you a good feel for um, what the minimum uh, detectable continuum flux is for each of the grisms. But we're going to calculate the 
integration times for each one of the GRISMs um, separately using a site. So, uh, so the next step then is to get some is to estimate your fluxes for each uh, for each of the GRISMs, and usually one w a good way to do that is uh, using uh, the Wise catalog, uh, which is available through URSA the Infrared Science Archive uh, at IPAC. And so I went ahead and looked up the Wise fluxes for AB or IGA. Um, these are just estimates; these are just approximations. Uh, for so for W two at four point six microns, ten Janskys. W3 at 12 microns is 27 Janskys, and at uh, W4 it's 50 Janskys at 22 microns. And so what I did was that I, I estimated the uh, flux at the center point of each uh, one of the grisms, um, either interpolating or extrapolating from the from the Y's fluxes. And these are all things that you would need to put in your technical justification to indicate exactly uh, how you've you've uh, estimated the fluxes for each. Uh, for each one of the grisms. Now note at uh, 329 uh, we don't actually have a very good um, uh, estimate uh, of the uh, of the uh, flux at G329. Uh, I'm actually going to end up just uh, using uh, an estimate of 50 Janskys here as just a rough number. Okay so now that we have our, our estimated fluxes uh, for each one of the grisms uh, and we decided which chrisms we're going to use. Uh, then we can go to the uh, Sophia Instrument Time Estimator and uh, plug those in. Okay, so we're going to use using forecast and grism mode. So we're going to use the grism time estimator. And so make sure you read all the all the notes uh, when you're using the uh, spectros spectroscopic time estimators. And then scroll down, and here's our input observing parameters. So, one of the key things that we have to establish is uh, what our ideal signal noise will, uh, what our desired signal noise is. Um, ideally, you'd like to have a signal noise of 50 um, or higher, um, and the reason for this is is primarily to enable good telluric correction um, as part of the post processing in the pipeline. Uh, you can get away with less, um, but uh, ideally, you'd like to go as, as high as possible. Uh, now, this is a very—you'll see this is a very bright source, and so we can um, so we can actually use uh, the two the smaller slit, the narrower slit at 2.4 arc seconds. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. If you had a source that was much much fainter, then you might want to choose a, a wider slit. So let's start with the uh, G063 uh, Grism. And uh, the quantity that we're estimating is the total integration time. And we'll go ahead and use the 2.4 arc second uh, slit. And our required signal to noise ratio is going to be 50. And we leave uh, the uh, on source integration time blank. That's what we're trying to estimate. Uh, this will be for a point source. And so now we go back and look at our flux estimate for G063. That's 12 Janskys. So we'll go ahead and put 12 Janskys in here. And, but that's going to be at the center of the uh, G063 uh, wave band. And so that's uh, 6.3 microns. There we go. Now, uh, if you know roughly the, the color uh, or the temperature of your source, then you can use a, uh, then you can use a black body uh, to, to estimate the shape of the SED across the uh, across the grism uh, wavelength range. If you don't know it, you can always put just put in a power law uh, with zero, and that just makes it flat across the across the uh, grism range. And that's kind of the easiest way to to uh, to do the estimation if you're not sure what the temperature or the shape of the SED is. Okay, so once you've got all these put in, then we can submit. Scroll down to the bottom, and so uh, so here uh, the output uh, gives you the the uh, sorry the input parameters are shown here that you put in so that you can uh, check them, um, and down here at the bottom you have a plot of the 
exposure time uh, required to achieve the signal to noise of 50 um, as a function of wavelength. And the reason it's as a function of wavelength is, again, uh, because of all these atmospheric lines. Uh, so if we look back at um, this plot here, you can see there's lots of atmospheric lines through the uh, 6.3 micron uh, grism, and those uh, uh, have a tremendous effect upon the uh, 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 total integration time and uh, upon the sensitivity. And so the way to read this is that you need um, at least, a, so this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 seconds here. So you need at least 60 seconds of integration time to achieve uh, sig signal to noise roughly across the entire band. Okay. So here I'm going to say, you know, GO630 requires 60 seconds of integration time. Then I just repeat this. Let's do it for one more. So I just repeat this now for the next one, let's say G111, again with the 2.4 uh, arc second slit, signal noise of 50. This time our, our flux estimate at G111 is going to be 27 Janskys at 11 microns. So we put in 27 here at 11.1. And we'll keep the, the same power law with index of 0 so it's flat across the, across the range. Submit. Okay, so now looking at the bottom here, um, now you can see this time we've got 100 seconds here. So you need somewhere between, you know, around 100 seconds uh, or so to ensure that you get signal to noise of 50 across the whole band. So you can see in this in this region here where there's relatively little um, atmosphere. So you can see here relatively little atmospheric transmission uh, and so the um, so the total integration time is lowest in this area. The integration time is highest in these very uh, saturated uh, telluric bands here due to ozone. Um, so here uh, I put in a hundred seconds uh, for signal noise of 50 uh, roughly across that band. You can set it to 200 seconds if you want it as well. Okay, and then you continue that. Uh, you repeat the same procedure for the 227 and the 329. Now, note that the 329 uh, Chrism is only operates with uh, with the large uh, with the large slit. So with the 4.7 micron. With, sorry, with the 4.7 arc second slit. So you'll need to select the 4.7 arc second slit um, when you use site for G329, and that's actually uh, uh, stipulated in the observation planning section of the, um, of the observer's handbook. Okay, so these are all relatively short, uh, so the, uh, and obviously comfortably fit onto uh, a SOFIA flight leg, so, uh, so the feasibility looks very good, um, which, you, which we are not surprised about because the object is so bright, uh, and so we should uh, continue on with the proposal. Okay, so the next step then is to open U-Spot. Okay, and uh, here we have the main proposal page that we talked a little bit about in the uh, imaging part of the example. Uh, this is where you enter all the information uh, related to the overall proposal itself, including things like the abstract, the, uh, the PDF attachment for the science and technical justification and, and bios and so forth. Um, also uh, for the uh, investigators here. So, but we want to move on to the observation part. We're going to uh, define our observations, our AORs. First thing we'll do is create a new target for AB or IGA. We'll resolve. So this looks, so it's resolved the RA and deck now for AB or IGA. So click OK. And so now we'll create a, uh, an AOR. We're going to use forecast cruising mode. OK. So here, uh, it's important to give your, uh, your AORs a, a unique label that makes some sense. Um, 
that's useful to you. So we'll start with AB or Rigan. We'll call this uh, GO63. This will be our GO63 observation. You can see it's picked up uh, AB or Rigan here as the target. Um, so the exposure time we take directly from site. So for GO63, the exposure time is 60 seconds, which is the default there. Uh, instrument configuration now. Uh, we, for the GO63, we need to be in short wavelength camera, GO63, nothing in the long wavelength camera, and we're going to use the 2.4 arc second slit. Okay, perfect. Uh, so there are um, a number of different uh, chop nod modes. Uh, the most imp the nod match chop is the is the default and uh, usually is sufficient for whatever observation uh, that you need to carry out. Uh, there are times when you might want to use the NXCAC mode, which is basically the spectroscopic equivalent of C2NC2. And if you, um, uh, and the C2NC2 mode we discussed in the, in the last uh, example. Uh, also, there's a good description of uh, NXCAC and the C2NC2 nod chop modes, or sorry, chop nod modes, um, in the observer's handbook. Um, the time when you would use a, a NXCAC is if the, again, if there was a lot of nebulosity. So it'd be worth just checking uh, the Y's image just to see if there is a lot of nebulosity surrounding AB Uriga. So let's just take a look at band two should be fine. Um, Nine arc minutes also fine. Uh, this is for the Ys, the Ys image. Click OK. Yeah, so there's not really any extensive nebulosity surrounding uh, AB or Rigan. So, so nod match chop uh, should be fine. You can overlay the those positions. Oops. by clicking on current AOR in the overlays. And now you can see the, um, the red uh, slit is the uh, on-source position, and then the green and the blue are the uh, two off-source positions uh, for a uh, nod match chop. Keep in mind that you don't uh, have control over the slit angle on the sky in general. Uh, so you want to ensure um, that uh, uh, sorry, if your if your observation requires a, a defined slit angle, uh, you really need to work with the instrument scientist um, to uh, see if if that can be uh, constrained. Okay. So, but this looks good. Um, and so now, uh, what we need to do is uh, complete the rest of the. Um, AORs, one for each uh, grism. So you can see here, here's our first one for the GO63. Uh, so you can see its filter is GO63 at 60, at an exposure time of 60 seconds. There we go. Easiest way to do this, honestly, is to simply duplicate uh, each of the um, AORs and then change the, change the details. Uh, once they're uh, once they've been created, so I'll duplicate once, twice, three times, and then we'll go into the next one. This one will be for the G111. So G111 requires 100 seconds integration time, and G111 is in the SWC. So there's the SWC, and we'll be using the small slit in nod match chop mode again. And OK, all done. And we do that again. And this will be for the G, uh, G227, 60. And so again, we need 60 seconds of exposure time for G227 
Uh, this time G227 is in the uh, long wavelength camera, so we put like that, so it automatically switches the, uh, the configuration as needed based on what you choose, on which grism you choose. Uh, small slit again, sorry, narrow slit again. Not a match chop, okay. And the last one. This will be maybe like a G329. And this one, I believe, was a uh, 100 seconds. And G329 automatically switches to LWC. And you have to switch to the large slit in this case. OK. So now you've got all your uh, AORs created, ready to go. And uh, so you can see that the total uh, duration for all four of them is only 13 minutes. So this is very achievable. And in fact, you could even uh, increase the exposure time on these uh, somewhat if you really wanted to, if you wanted to get uh, much, much better signal and noise or ensure that you have even better um, blur correction. Okay, and that's, that's the end of uh, this example. Thanks.